It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and with us is Sarah Chris Meyer, here to talk about our book, Becoming Women of the Word, How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. Thanks for being here, Sarah. Hey, Kyle. Great to be with you. This book is dedicated to your mom and your daughter and granddaughter, and you also have a quote from your aunt in here. So how have women had an influence on your faith? Hugely. I come from a long line of actually mostly missionaries, Protestant missionaries, pastors, evangelists, and so on. And both the men and the women, but particularly the women, have had an effect on my life by living their faith, by being very devoted to God and trusting Him in all kinds of circumstances. And I think the women in particular took the time to tell the stories and pass them on. So Hmm. just by seeing their life and hearing those stories, I've gotten a deep sense of the faith from them. What kind of stories do you mean? Hmm. So my mother's family in particular was were missionaries in the Far East, and they were in Shanghai when the communists came and, um, you know, experienced bombs falling down around their wow. building and just really kind of life and death situations. And they're sitting there with children trying to explain to them and prepare them for what might happen and so on. And I tell a couple of the stories in the book, actually, about how knowing the stories of the Bible and being able to hang on to those stories and the lessons that they had learned really helped them to get through some very difficult times. Sure. One story doesn't have to do with the story in the Bible, but it stands out to me at the moment. The communists are, are approaching and they're listening to the radio and, and so on. And just, it, it's getting very, very tense. And at one point, a storm comes up. And my mother, who was just a child at the time, she remembers my grandmother going over to the window and throwing it open so that all the wind and rain and everything is coming in. And she's just almost exulting and saying, this is my God's storm. And letting the kids to know God is the one who's in control here of the weather, of the storm of war, of everything. He is in control and we're going to put our trust in him. That's great. You also teach scripture. You worked on the Great Adventure Bible series. So Mm -hmm. how did your love for scripture begin? Well, I think that actually probably begins with my mom. My dad also, but we, uh, my childhood was steeped in the Bible and actually particularly in the Old Testament. We had stories every day at dinner. My dad played the M&M game with us, so we'd get an M&M if we answered good questions (laughs) and he answered the questions right. That made it fun. But my mom also made um, teaching moments or when when we're playing a game, you know, she would set up a, a, a table of sand on the table and we would have two hills with a stream in the middle and we'd have David marching up the side and Goliath on the other and, hmm. you know, play out the the story. So it was always fun, which is a great way to get stories into people. But it, I think it went a long way into forming who I am, that I heard all these stories. And then I just continued in my love of it as I got older. Do you have a favorite Bible story? Oh, wow. Probably not. But... <laughs> At the moment, <laughs> at the moment, I um, I love the story of Adam and Eve in the garden because it sets everything up, and it seems so simple on on one level, but on the other hand, we can see so many patterns of how temptation happens and so on that we so that we can recognize it in our own lives just by seeing how the serpent tempted them, mm-hmm. but we also see how much God loved them. Mm. And the the profound love that God has for his children that does not get changed when they turn their backs on him. Uh, that's just mind-blowing to me. You know, when we watch Adam and Eve picking up after the fall and moving forward and, and still relying on God, even though they don't have the same relationship anymore. And you see God's faithfulness through the years in spite of his children's fickleness. It's just the most beautiful thing. Well, and 
the book is called Becoming Women of the Word. So what do you mean by a woman of the word? What does that mean to be the, a woman of the word? Woman of the word. And it could be the same thing of a man of the word. It just doesn't have the same alliteration. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, th- this is related to why there's a tree on the cover of a book that is really about women of the Bible. I think of a person of the word of a, as a person who is so saturated with the word of God that it becomes part of them. And there is a picture in Psalm 1 of a tree planted beside the rivers of water. And the tree on my book cover is a tree that's planted in the desert, and yet it's flourishing. And when we have our spiritual roots, you might call them, plunged into the Word, whether it's through Scripture, um, the sacraments and liturgy, Mass, prayer, when our roots are firmly planted that way, All kinds of things can be happening above ground, you know, storms and drought and whatever, but we will stand fast. Hmm. And that's what I want to be. (laughs) So, Woman of the Word to me says that. We're talking with Sarah Chrismeyer. The book is Becoming Women of the Word, How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. And where did you get the idea for this book? Well, as you mentioned the the Bible timeline, you know, the Great Adventure Catholic Bible Study Program, I have been teaching the overall story of Scripture for many years, and particularly focusing on the Old Testament, because Catholics seem to be less familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And as you make your way through that story, it, you know, it talks about how God called people into a relationship with Himself, like Abraham, who He called to leave everything and follow to this unknown place. Or the people of Israel, who he calls to hear his word and to do it and be a light to the nations. And one day I realized, or maybe it was just kind of a gradual dawning on me, that we always put the focus on the men as the patriarchs of Israel, the people who formed the people of God and who left their character stamped on those people. But nearly every one of those men has a woman beside him. Mm-hmm. And you know she's not just arm candy. <laughs> she's hmm. there for a purpose. And maybe I see this because I was formerly Protestant, and I thought of Mary as just a vessel. You know, somebody she God had to be born, so He picked her. And I I didn't really ever think of her as anything special beyond that. But in the same way that she has a vital role in the incarnation and so on. These women, who are the matriarchs of Israel, have a vital role in forming the people of God. You know, the Lord chose Sarah specifically to be the mother of his people. Abraham's story would have been a dead end without her in particular. Hmm. Um, it's her firstborn son who fathers the next generation. Their, their firstborn son, I should right. say. Sure. But if, if we look at them together, we look at the, at the women also, I think that we get a more complete, fuller picture of who the people of God are and how we live our faith. Not just how we have our faith, which tends to be more the men's story, but how we live that faith. So I've been exploring that, and I, a little bit of that comes out in this book. Can you give us an example of one of the women that you highlight in the book and a lesson that we can learn from her that maybe we've missed when we've read through, or maybe we don't even really know her story that well? Sure. Something that really struck me was the story of Miriam. Miriam is Moses' sister, and she's actually given credit, especially in the Jewish community, for, along with Moses and Aaron, her two brothers, leading the people out of Egypt and to the Promised Land. And you see her in a few little snapshots, but but one of them is when the people of Israel are saved from Egypt, and they actually make it across the Red Sea, the first thing they do is Miriam leads the people in praise, and she leads the women in singing praise and dancing and playing their tambourines on the other side of the Red Sea. And I was kind of hanging out there thinking about (laughs) what I was going to write, you know, what what, what can we learn from this scene? And it occurs to me that there was something very important there. You know, the people have been slaves for hundreds of years, maybe, for quite a long time. They are subjected to backbreaking labor. 
lots of fear. More recently, all the sons are being killed. Any, any male boys who are born are being thrown into the Nile and killed. And yet these women who are dealing with this grief and, and so on, they made tambourines. They learned how to play them. They knew how to dance and how to praise. They didn't just do something that was completely foreign to them when they got to the other side of the Red Sea. They were doing it all along. And, you know, even the night they left Egypt, they're only able to take the necessities. They take those tambourines with them. They were preparing to praise. Hmm. And I just thought of how important it is in our lives to always praise God in everything to give thanks, in everything to praise Him, not to wait until He has solved every problem for us, but in the middle of everything to be thankful to praising Him. It is an incredibly potent spiritual weapon, and it's an incredible instrument of growth for ourselves, and I believe it gives God a lot of glory and happiness to see it kind of readjust our focus to, to look at him on the one who loves us, the one who has the power to save, as opposed to focusing on our problems. I like that. The subtitle of the book is How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. How, how mm-hmm. does this book help us to answer that question? I think by giving examples, it's not easy to answer God's call. Uh, maybe sometimes it is, mm. but... A lot of times he's calling us in times of great difficulty or, you know, Sarah and Abraham get called and what they're being called to do is impossible. They can't have children, you know, even the land where they're going to, they don't own any of it and it's barren. And uh, God calls us to do the impossible sometimes or the improbable or the unpleasant or, you know, it's, it's not easy. So I think each one of these women from the Old Testament that I look at, and I've paired each of them with the story of somebody I know, they show us how to, maybe if you take them collectively, that God is faithful, how to hear His voice, how to listen to it, how to say yes in the midst of all these difficulties, mostly by focusing on who He is, what He's done, what He's promised, so that we can answer His call with purpose, enter into his purpose, and I think the joy comes out of that. Great. Well, I think these stories are, like you mentioned, uh, ones that we don't know well, much less do we know what we can get out of these stories and and how to apply them to our lives. So this is going to be really Mm -hmm. helpful. So where should we send people to get a copy of the book? Ave Maria Press. Dot com. Avi Marie is the publisher of the book, and it's also on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, places like that. You also can go to my website, which is comeintotheword.com. All right, comeintotheword.com, and the book again is Becoming Women of the Word, How to Answer God's Call with Purpose and Joy. All right, thank you so much, Sarah Chrismeyer, for sharing a little bit about it with us. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kyle. God bless you.